Well, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Dean Lockhart. I'm the convener of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee at the Scottish Parliament. I would welcome everyone to this special online edition of Festival of Politics 2021, uh, which is run in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Future Forum. The title of this evening's panel is What Will Power My Home in 2045? and is held in partnership with the School of Social and Political Science, University of Edinburgh. And I'm delighted that so many people I can see have joined us online this evening, and I look forward to any comments or questions you may have after the initial introduction by the panel. Now, uh, Scotland is often cited as Europe's potential green powerhouse, where renewable and clean energy is plentiful. But there are a number of challenges that we need to address to realise this potential. How do we overcome the resource, commercial and behavioural barriers to achieve this potential? How and when will re renewable energy power our homes and workplaces? What can we learn from, from other nations? And how will households uh, with fuel poverty and those in social housing be affected by the transition to a low carbon uh, environment? And um, this evening, the panel will uh, address all of these issues and any other issues that the audience may have. And I'm very pleased to introduce our panel this evening. Dr. Niall Kerr is an interdisciplinary energy researcher with a background in social and politi political science and economics at the University of Edinburgh. Stuart Patton is chair of H2 Green, a Scottish-based company focused on the development of green hydrogen hubs for heavy good vehicles and trains. Dr. Catherine Bale is an Associate Professor at the University of Leeds, working across engineering, economics and social science. And Dr. Claudia Aravina is an Assistant Professor in Economics at Watt University. As I said, there will be an opportunity for our online audience to post questions uh, in the chat box uh, throughout uh, this session, and I look forward to taking your questions uh, later on. If you do have a question, it would be really good if you could put down your, your first name in the chat box where you are in Scotland, and we'll get through as many of those questions as we can. Uh, but let me begin um, maybe by asking our, each of our panellists to summarise, in their view, what renewable energy sources are currently on offer, and are we now getting close to a tipping point for using renewable energy as an energy source for heating? And let me first put that question to uh, Dr. Kerr, uh, then to be followed by Do Dr. Catherine Bale, uh, then Stuart Patton, and finally Dr. Claudia Aravina. So uh, over to you, Dr. Kerr. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so yeah, the the renewable heating uh, technologies that are available are um, well, what's available to different households. Partly depends on um, your location. So heat pumps receive a lot of attention. Uh, and they are suitable in a lot of properties. Uh, perhaps individual heat pumps are, are, are not suitable for, for flats or, or smaller properties, which are space constrained. Um, in those properties, there are other electric heating options, like more uh, new generation electric storage heaters. Um, in rural areas, biomass boilers are an option, but they are uh, less of an option in urban areas due to air pollution concerns. Um, uh, in maybe in the in the near future, if you live in a in a heat dense urban area, you may you may have um, uh, access to or you may be offered a connection to a heat network, a low carbon heat network. Um, and in the longer term, there is a, a chance that uh, there may be low carbon gases such as hydrogen, um, which are available in in the gas grid. Um, but that's a bit longer term and a bit more on uncertain. Uh, whether it's a tipping point. Um, it's, yeah, it's hard to say. Maybe in the future we might look back at this point with the heat uh, and building strategies in the UK and in Scotland, and it, it might be, um, you know, see a tipping point in the future. I was looking at data earlier today, which suggests that uh, the number of heat pumps that have gone in uh, the UK has uh, risen from about 30,000 last year to about 70,000 already this year. So there is a uh, an increase is an uptake, and I think a lot of that's driven by by new buildings. Um, so yeah, it, it may seem. Uh, when we look back at the future of 2021, maybe um, some sort of uh, tipping point. Thanks very much for that. And uh, I'll hand over to you now, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, Dean, and thanks very much for, for the introduction. 
Um, I should point out, I decided at late stage to put the doctor on, although I'm a doctor of geology, I thought I'd better keep up with the rest of the panellists here and, and have the doctor in front of the title. Um, I think it's interesting. I think you know, I've spent my whole career in oil and gas until recently uh, chairing a company called H2 Green, and we, we work in green hydrogen specifically for, well, mainly for transport, uh, because we see that's the, the niche area where, trans, where, where green hydrogen really has a niche over alternatives, you know, for example, batteries for uh, vehicles. Um, I think the real tipping point has come just because of, I just see a huge change in, in the nature of the discussion about climate change and decarbonisation in the last two years. Um, I think one of the big changes obviously we've seen recently as well is the huge increase in gas price. And maybe that sort of macro issue will be what causes the tipping point here, because I just think, and you know, I'm sure we'll come back to it later on. You know, I'm not sure members of the public are ready to sort of unilaterally you know, go out and decide to change because they just fancy decarbonising their homes, changing to heat pumps or whatever. But I think the big changes are those much that much bigger awareness of decarbonisation and um, pressures like gas. You know, and I think now, you know, historically, electricity has been a relatively expensive method of heating your home. Actually, gas is. Relatively expensive now. Now, what that will mean longer term is very hard to say. But I think big pressures like that will be what really drive drive the changes. I don't, and Neil's discussed it. I don't. I don't think there are a huge range of technical solutions to this. I think the challenges are much more about the economic and the the behavioural changes that I'm sure we'll come back to later on. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Stuart and uh, Claudia. Over to you next. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dean. And uh, well, uh, I think Naya made a, a very good uh, description of uh, of how is I mean in terms of hitting this. I'm gonna say a bit of uh, the sources in terms of uh, we have on one side the uh, gas in, in the 80% of the UK households, and then a lot of electricity. Now this electricity is uh, now produced a lot with uh, renewables. Now, the tipping point, I see this, I, I feel like saying like, yes, it is happening with a process that is mainly driven by the targets and uh, the policies uh, announced by the uh, government, in which uh, we know that um, Britain's electricity will come uh, from renewables by 2035. And we are aiming to uh, hit net zero by 2050. So we can say that, that I mean, this tipping point uh, is is uh, uh, there and maybe um, possible. Now uh, that uh, I support what has said uh, Stuart is not only uh, the increase in uh, renewables and the heat pumps that we can bring in. We need first, uh, together with this, uh, uh, to introduce society without a society, the society here and the behavioral uh, change. Uh, no matter how good uh, the technology is, we we may be not able uh, to get that. So, um, yeah, that is uh, the main point I, I would say in terms of, and also introduce not only the normal sources like wind or solar, but also a storage is another point to take into account. Thanks very much, uh, Claudia. You, you mentioned, in fact, I think everyone so far has mentioned behavioural change, and, and I do have a question about that later on because it does seem to be uh, one of the central components of the, the transition to net zero. But let me uh, put my first question to Catherine. Catherine, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks, Dean. So. Just to give a bit of context, I went to look at um, some numbers from one of the pathways that the Committee on Climate Change have outlined as to how we'll get to net, or net zero commitment by 2050, and looking at where we are now with heating technologies and where we need to be. So at the moment, as Claudia mentioned, we currently have around uh, we have gas, gas boilers in around 85% of homes, um, and that needs to be down to less than. 15, if we're talking about 2045, uh, which is the, the date we're thinking about for this, this discussion, which is only, of course, five years before we need to get to net zero. So that shows the scale of the challenge. Um, I think that's around 17 million homes 
uh, we need to go to into each and every one of those homes. It's not going to be as easy as um, decarbonizing the power grid, where actually pretty much everybody in their own homes hasn't had to change that much, and we've we've done a good job of bringing down the carbon intensity of the grid. This challenge requires going into every single person's home. So we've got gas boilers. Currently, 85% needs to be less than 15, and that tipping point needs to be in the next few years before sort of 2030. Um, heat, heat networks, Mal mentions an, as an option for urban areas. They're currently supplying about 2 to 3% of um, UK homes, and that needs to grow to around 20%. So there's a huge challenge there with those big infrastructure projects. And then heat pumps have been mentioned, and they're obviously a big focus at the moment because of the heat and building strategy. They're currently in around 1 to 2% of homes, and that needs to rapidly increase up to around 75% in, in this one scenario. Um, and that's where we need to see a tipping point really soon. Uh, th those things need to be happening in the next few years. And then there's other smaller options, perhaps um, houses that are off, off the gas grid will have different solutions, solar thermal, biomass boilers, those kind of things could come into play there. Hopefully that gives us a, a sort of scale of the challenge we're thinking about. It, it does actually, and it is great context. That, thanks to each of you for for providing that that context, and and frankly the the sense of scale of the challenge. And I think that brings me on to the question on behavioural change because there's fundamental change is going to be required. Um, I wonder if the the panel could talk about what their view is in terms of the the public appetite uh, to make the change. Uh, is there evidence to show that people are willing to give up, give up their gas boilers, uh, to pay for the new energy sources, be it district heating, uh, heat pumps or hydrogen. And how, how is this going to be financed? We, we've heard announcements from the Scottish Government and the UK Government in terms of partial financing for heat pumps or a hydrogen boiler. But, but obviously, um, from what I can see, it won't cover all of the cost of, of doing so. So I wonder if, if the panel could address this point, or I guess there are two points, but interconnected points, behavioural change, how to drive that, and the related point of how this is going to be financed. And um, sure, maybe I, maybe I could uh, ask you first to do or to address that issue, and then Neil, Catherine, and Claudia. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dean. I think those are really good questions. I think, and I can speak for very personal experience actually here. To maybe think about the, the behavioural issue, we recently looked at changing to a heat pump. So we're in a rural location in Perthshire. Uh, we have oil fire central heating, so we're off grid, and usually that's a more expensive option than um, gas. Probably, probably isn't going to be soon. Um, and we looked at heat pumps, and and I think at the moment it's still really challenging because okay, it's retrofitting to a house. I think somebody mentioned earlier a lot of the heat pumps we put in at the moment are probably going into new builds, and that's easier. But retrofitting into a house, you and it, it, it sounds trivial, but it's the stuff that everybody will think about. Your radiators run at lower temperature. Well, that probably means you need more radiators in your house. So you've not just got the heat pump, you've got to think about the rest of the, the system in the house. We've all got used to probably nice, probably cosier than we should houses. Well actually if you've got a heat pump, you're not going you're not going to get that. You know, potentially you've to back up with electricity. So I think it's I think it comes down to with a lot of these things, it comes down to really quite specific behavioural changes. And yes, it'll come in time and heat pumps will improve and all these sort of things in time. But we personally we just couldn't make the decision. We we decided not. The time isn't yet for us. In principle we could have afforded it. The time is the time is not yet. And I think that's a real shame. And it will come, but I think if that's us really reasonably knowledgeable about the situation, you know, most people won't make the decision yet. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done on the behavioural side. If I can be overly simplistic, possibly on the cost front, um, I think what we need is a carbon tax. Because at the moment, of course, one of the principal reasons why heat pumps and, and electricity is more expensive is because gas is frankly too cheap. You know, we don't we don't tax gas for the CO two emissions of the gas, and I think that be you know that's a huge change, and that isn't just the British government having to, you know, Scottish and British government having to do that, but that would need to be a much bigger factor. But I think as we'll come back and you have if this happens in every discussion on net zero and decarbonisation. Um, 
uh, carbon tax is, is the way to solve a lot of these problems. But that's obviously been looked at a lot of times, and it's a very difficult bridge for for us to to cross economically. Yeah, well, I think that's right, Stuart. And with COP26 coming up, it strikes me this is with the profile COP26 is getting it's uh, it's a good opportunity to raise that public awareness. But but ways, raising public awareness is one thing, but having the financial support and having the right incentives in place, both to reduce uh, reliance on fossil fuels, but also increase uh, reliance on uh, renewables, is 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 another uh, fundamental uh, factor in this, and, and something for poly policymakers to to really take into account. Uh, Niall, uh, would welcome your thoughts on this uh, question. Um, yes. Yeah, so on the on the on the point about um, public willingness to to change. Um, in, uh, in these kind of discussions, it's, it's often highlighted um, that there is you know, an overwhelming majority of people, when surveyed in the UK or when data is gathered, um, are concerned or are very concerned about climate change, and, and they appreciate that emission reductions are necessary. You know, very high uh, majority for for uh, in response to those sorts of questions. But then, when you pull people on uh, the uh, impact or the role of, of their heating systems, at, at least until maybe recently, this might be changing the amount of attention that uh, the area is getting. But at least until recently, it was a, a, a large amount of people didn't really associate their their gas boiler or their heating system as being a major contributor to emissions. As I say, with the, the, the you know headlines that have been generated this week and you know, and, and by COP, um, awareness is 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 probably changing that heating is a, is a really big contributor. Um, and it, uh, the, all the options that are available, I mean, the options I was listing earlier, uh, there are you know, different options for different types of properties. They all have pretty major challenges associated with them, um, and often they all have uh, well major costs associated with them. Um, and there are uh, well, there's a new uh, England, um, new grant available in England and Wales. Uh, there's a different kind of grant available in Scotland, which we were generous, and there's an interest-free loan alongside that. Um, but yeah, there'll, there'll have to be some sort of contribution, probably from from households as well. The degree that government are willing to put public money into to subsidising things is is a bit of an uh, uh, an open question. Um, but there is public money available at the moment. Whether uh, how much. Uh, will be available in the, in the future remains to be seen. Uh, the hope is uh, that the cost will be able to be driven down on things like heat pumps. Um, and some of the ambitions in the UK government strategy are, are, are pretty optimistic. I think it's fair to say. I think that they're even suggesting they could possibly drive down the cost of a heat pump at least by half uh, by 2025. Most of the evidence suggests that that will be very very challenging. Um, and that the, the costs of transitioning to low carbon heat is something that we might need to get to get used to a little bit and try to work out how we're going to pay for it, whether we, where the money is going to come from. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's that. Uh, yeah, I think costs are, are going to be an issue um, for a, for a for possibly the duration of this transition. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Niall. And uh, I'll, I'll <clears throat> ask uh, Catherine to come in now. And Catherine, I know you've done a lot of work. Um, Across central government and, and local government, and I one, one additional uh, factor, if you could uh, perhaps give your views on, is the role of local government uh, as a delivery partner in in all of this. You know, district heating as well as um, heat and buildings. The the strategy announced a couple of weeks ago by the Scottish government. It seems to me that there's there's quite a considerable responsibility being placed on local government to to deliver these targets. Okay, you have the UK government, the Scottish government, obviously with with um, central governmental responsibilities, but but the on the ground impact will to a large extent be be for local government. So I guess uh, sorry about this, but two questions for you. One is on behavioural, one is on behavioural change, and and the other is you know the role of uh, local governments. And I'll, I'll leave you <laughs> deal with that as 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 you like. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so just picking up the behavioural thing first, I think we need to slightly reframe it. So I don't think it's a case that people do want a boiler or do want a heat pump or, or don't like one or the other. What people want is warm, comfortable homes that they can affordably heat or cool. Nobody's mentioned cooling yet, but that is a factor we need to consider at some point. Um, and I think it's the familiarity of gas boilers that mean people are comfortable with them. 
you know so it's the familiarity that you, you think it might be reliable it's not necessarily that you want a combi boiler in you your cupboard maybe you would be happy with a heat bump but it's much less familiar we don't know people that have them i think what we'll see is changes like we've seen a little bit with electric vehicles you start to get to know oh such and such down the road has got a heat pump now they say it's really great bills have come down i think that can be really powerful um, and i think what we need to do is a better job of explaining what the benefits could be but couch that in how people live their lives so it's not just about you know how much it costs and how much space or how much it costs but and how much carbon emissions it might save but it's things like what you know how much space does it take up what does it look like how does it fit into your routines um how would you actually use things we see we see when we start to understand people's lived experiences with technologies we can start to see how we can overcome some of these barriers and it might be things like you know my teenagers keep switching on the heating and i want to have a thermostat control and it's, it's all those sort of family dimensions that we need to really understand. So I think there's a real role for more research around how people not only perceive and but also use these technologies. We're actually running a study, colleagues at the University of Leeds are doing some work with um, residents in a tower block in Leeds that have just been switched over to a shared ground source heat network. Um, and I think the, the uh, early results are that people are favorable to it, they've seen bills come down. So I think it's about sharing that evidence to show what the benefits could be to other people. So, and actually I was gonna pick up on the, um, um, the local authority angle because previous work we've done understanding perceptions of small scale energy storage. So batteries in homes, uh, we did some focus groups and survey work with people to understand their perceptions around possibly putting those into homes. And one of the things that really came through was um, if it is who was running that scheme. So if they'd previously had some um, engagement with a local authority, so often these people were in homes that had had solar panels installed by the local authority. And however they viewed that experience of the solar panel installation really affected how they were gonna think about possibly having a battery storage. So, that shows how much these trusted relationships really matter. If we're thinking about local authorities delivering heat networks, delivering community scale heating, uh, maybe um, supplying heat pumps in, in, in council owned properties, it's really um, the sort of relationship that the local authority already has with with those residents is really important. And often that is good because local authorities are trusted actors, especially as compared with other actors in the market, people are less <laughs> trusting of their energy supplier um, as compared with public uh, authorities. Um, so that's where I think local authorities have got a real opportunity. So to your point about what can local authorities do and, and why, um, there's real benefits to local authorities getting involved in schemes like heat networks because they're not just after the carbon emissions reductions. They're also considering issues around fuel poverty, air pollution issues, you know, warmer homes lead, lead to uh, healthier, happier people in general. That, that helps with a lot of um, targets and initiatives that local actors are interested in. Um, so there's definitely a lot to go out there. I think there's lots of nuance in how schemes are rolled out and, and that's where research that we're doing can help with those kind of issues. Yeah, thanks very much, Catherine. I, I, I completely agree with you, the, the, the importance of local authorities and also um, community councils and community groups can really, when yeah. it comes to small scale district heating, can, can really make a difference. It's kind of showing, it's almost demystifying some of the technology and showing that it actually can work. And I, I've, in my own constituency, I've seen that with broadband, where people have set up their own sort of mini uh, broadband uh, system, you know, a couple of years ago. And as soon as they did that, other communities nearby kind of followed suit. So it's that kind of community-led uh, experience, which I think is really important. And Claudia, I, I know that you've done a lot of work in, you know, economic uh, behaviour and incentives. So you know, this whole topic of behavioural change, I'd be interested to get your perspective. You know, is it a, is it a top-down thing that government can legislate for, or do, is, it, is it more about you know, public awareness and nudging people 
to do the right thing? Well, here, when we talk about behavioral change, or I, I wouldn't call it a really a behavioral change, so many times just behavior in energy. Uh, when we talk about change, what change we, we are talking about in terms of behavior? So we have two types of changes here, or uh, behavioral uh, issues. Let's say one is adoption, and the other one is the, let's call it energy use. Okay, so on the way of adoption, uh, and also this affect the energy use, we have a, a, a lot of things that influence uh, behavior. We have incentives, uh, values, uh, attitudes, uh, habits. So uh, I would say the first thing before a regulation is people. What are their habits? And what is the needs that we need do we want them adopting new technology? Do we want them to use the technology or to use the energy in a different way? And if that is the way, we talk a lot about uh, reducing energy use, but sometimes probably the reduction is not the optimal, but it's the efficiency. So we all uh, say like, okay, let's reduce energy, let's reduce en energy. But if we continue uh, generating this energy in a certain way, probably we are not getting uh, really uh, the target and what. So it's an efficient, um, in, it's an efficient uh, use. So how we influence uh, the behavior, and here is when the top down comes through the incentives. Uh, designing the right incentives. And then we talk about, for example, carbon taxes. We talk about subsidies. Uh, important here is the social acceptance. Do people really accept and have a good perception of this? So that if we know the uh, social acceptance, if we, if we know how people will react to the policy instrument in advance, we know that we are going to be effective and that will work uh, and also this needs to go together with the engineering uh, part so there are a lot uh, you will uh, ask if uh, there is evidence there is a lot of evidence in the research and actually scotland was one of the first uh, in uh, doing research of willingness to pay for renewables um, so there was a, a, a group uh, of uh, researchers here who did uh, energy uh, research for renewables, how much people are willing to pay for that. And uh, there is a huge literature in that. I did that in Chile. And I, uh, I just finished, uh, it's published this week actually, a, a work in, in Chile on willingness to pay of people for uh, energy efficiency. When we realize that uh, actually uh, the behavioral part, the acceptance uh, is important together with the financial instrument. So financial instruments, you, you get the, the government, uh, you get uh, helping in that. Then you have the social situation and uh, what the comfort and all those parts. So that's important. And in, in terms of just trying to be uh, very briefly in, in, in your second part uh, of uh, the uh, heat pumps. So uh, th there is an uh, incentive uh, that nowadays is 5,000 uh, pounds. But uh, uh, we see the same like in electric vehicles. For example, in Ireland, there was a 5,000 euro incentive for uh, adoption of electric vehicles. And we get again to, to behavior. So here you have 500, uh, about 5,000 uh, euro, and no one. We just had in two years 200 cars sold. So what's going on? I mean, what happened? You, you have 5,000 pounds for uh, heat pumps, but you need to look at the barriers. And one of the barriers is the uncertainty, uncertainty on the running cost. Uh, this use electricity, which is more expensive, and uh, because it may include a carbon tax. So we go, okay, should we then change to uh, taxing, what says, uh, Stuart say, taxing um, gas, for example. Then uh, they are designed for efficient houses. So if you put uh, 
a heat a pump in a house that is already inefficient, people will not be uh, will will fail in getting the comfort that Catherine was talking. So they will go back. So we have more cost. They will pay more, and we go back to the fossil fuel, uh, yeah, yeah. failing to achieve that. So, um, I think, I think Claudia, you, you actually preempted my next question because I, I, I completely agree with what you say about and, and the, the title of the, the session tonight is what will power my home in, in 2045 what you've just said is the, the the source of energy is important but what about the fabric of the building and so let, let, let me maybe flip the question to the fabric of the building because you know to what extent should policy focus on retrofitting to what extent should it focus on renewable sources of energy and to what extent should the priority be making sure the fabric of a house is airtight, effectively, uh, so that obviously less energy is required to make people comfortable? Uh, Catherine, you, you you touched on this as well. It'd be fascinating to get your perspective on this because I think I think this, as far as I can see, is a live discussion uh, with policymakers in terms of do you run all these policies at the same time in parallel? Maybe. Do you prioritise one over the other? What What would be your view on that, Catherine? What What should policymakers prioritise? And then, Niall, I'll bring you in a, 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 to this. Um, yeah. So I think it's a really good question, and I absolutely agree that we need to think of fabric first. But what I would say is it's as it's as wasteful to have an inefficient ho home and a gas boiler as it is to have an inefficient home and a heat pump. Neither situation is good, but we need to be doing both things in tangent, I think. So we absolutely need to be bringing housing stock up to better efficiency standards. But I don't think it's sensible to say, OK, wait till we've done all that first before we start thinking about the supply side. We're, um, we, you know, we're time constrained to meet the targets that we need to and to tackle the climate crisis that we're facing. We need we need to be doing both. So I think it's sort of. Um, not helpful to say let's wait until all the housing stock is brought up standard we know we've got 90 percent of our housing stock is still going to be here in 2050 so we do need to be thinking about retrofitting and i think that retrofitting needs to be energy efficiency and the, the heating technology itself um i think on the um slightly tying in with the cost issue as well i think it's important to distinguish between those who are able to pay and those who aren't so where where we need to be prioritizing funding is i think more for those who are not able to pay for these upgrades themselves and um if we're thinking about those who are able to pay what we need to be doing is tying it into other renovations that they're doing so for example you imagine well in fact this has happened to me your gas boiler goes it always goes in the winter it always feels like it's the coldest week of the winter whether it is or not um, you have to frantically scrabble about to get a replacement. You don't have time to look at different options. There's absolutely no way you can wait for a heat pump or something more complicated. So you get a replacement boiler because you're basically tied to it. For those um, households that, are, that have funds available for things like this, we need to be looking at incentives to piggyback onto, for example, when they're doing an extension, when they're getting a new kitchen. We need to be offering loans to tie into doing those big work. So it's not a case of my boiler's broken, I've got no option, I'm getting another combi. We need to, it needs to be sort of more strategic and it needs to tie into people wanting to do it. You know, nobody wants to spend their savings on insulation, it's boring. But if you're doing it, ripping out your kitchen or whatever, that's the time to be doing it. That, that's a different situation offering funding to those who are in poor quality building stock and are probably in fuel poverty and need funding to be able to do these things and i think there needs to be a distinction i, I noticed that in the um new heat and building strategy there's no distinction that and claudia mentioned that the 5k available for heat pumps i don't think there's any distinction in that that's been proposed yet about distinguishing between income and that I think that's possibly a mistake because we need to piggyback on people who can afford to do these things to do it for other reasons but as I said in my answer to my last question really outlining the benefits why you would do these things um, 
in some of our to, to think about the the situation of energy efficiency in larger infrastructure projects like heat networks uh, and some research that we did when we were thinking about how local authorities plan heat networks very often they'd go to heat demand data which gives you a sense of how financially viable a heat network would be as in where there's high heat demand you're going to get the financial return to put in a heat network but that actually is um, the wrong way to think about it because what you're doing there is overlooking those areas which are perhaps in fuel poverty have a suppressed heat demand don't obviously look like the place where you would want to put in a network for biggest financial gain but those are absolutely the places that you would want to put in a heat network to bring down the cost of heat for those people alleviate the fuel poverty situation reap the health and well-being benefits from that so we have to be a bit careful about um, how we measure where we're going to put things and it's not necessarily uh, so also in that case if we were looking at heat demand data you might put a heat network in where there's least energy efficiency because they're using lots of heat and again that might not be the best answer we might want to put a heat network where there is high energy efficiency so we need to be careful about how I think it's absolutely right that we need to think about both things together. We need to think about the efficiency of the housing stock in conjunction with the supply side to get the best the best options brought forward. Thanks very much, uh, Catherine. And Niall, I'll bring you in. But after that, I, I want to turn to Stuart to talk about the wider question of finance, because uh, Catherine mentioned the heat in buildings strategy announced by the Scottish Government a couple of weeks ago, which I think off the top of my head um, estimated the cost of, of about £33 billion to, to bring all of the buildings in Scotland up to energy efficiency levels, with I believe the majority of that to come from private sector investment, private sector finance. And Stuart, given your background with, with some of the private sector companies, I'd be interested in the question of how can the private sector be incentivised to invest and um, provide that capital, because it seems to me, you know, quite a considerable sum of money. But now, let me bring you in first about this question about you know, fabric of buildings, because I know you've you've done a lot of work in other countries, including the Netherlands, and I wonder if there's lessons to we can, I, I, you know, learn from other countries, Netherlands, the Nordic countries, in terms of this policy prioritisation between the fabric of buildings and and the heat sources, renewable sources. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, the, there will be uh, lessons to learn, but um, I think uh, it's fair to say that the, the UK is, is often characterised as having the oldest building stock in, in Europe. It certainly has, has the most buildings uh, that were built prior to 1940, and so it's a particularly old and a particularly energy inefficient stock. Um, so it is starting from a, a, a different position um, to a lot of other countries. Um, we have been implementing policy support for energy efficiency retrofit for, for many years, uh, so well over a decade there's been uh, government supported cavity wall insulation, loft insulation, a lot of cavity walls and lofts have been insulated on the back of that. There's still plenty that can be done and, and should be done. Um, energy, the energy efficiency is, is kind of universally accepted as, as the you know, a sensible thing to do energy efficiency improvements to, to our building stock um, for supporting technologies like heat pumps, um, but also another really important factor that's been touched on a couple of times is fuel poverty and fuel poverty targets um, alongside our emission reduction targets, which are very challenging and very ambitious. There are very challenging and very ambitious um, fuel poverty targets, so about a quarter of Scottish households are considered to be in fuel poverty, and they're trying to drive that down to, to very low levels at the same time as, as implementing um, what are potentially quite expensive uh, low carbon heat systems. So there might need to be um, some consideration of how the whole uh, thing is financed, um, especially with regards to lower income families who are already in fuel poverty. Energy efficiency makes extra sense in, in that um, context because it's something that can help to keep bills down. Um, it's, a, you know, it's an investment, it has a return. Um, and a lot of them will, will be able to, a lot of the um, energy efficiency retrofit will be able to, to pay for themselves. Um, on whether you would 
need to do with whether you should do you should focus on energy efficiency and then do low carbon heat. Um, I think I completely agree with uh, Catherine that you should be doing well, both at the same time, partly because of the targets. A lot of the subsidies that are available at the moment require you to implement energy efficiency first, so you can't get the renewable heat incentive unless you have implemented the cost effective uh, energy efficiency improvements first, and that applies to the subsidy scheme in, in Scotland as well. And that seems like a, a sensible approach. Uh, there are for obvious energy efficiency improvements that you can make. You should make them at the same time as um, as getting the the uh, new heating system installed. Um, on, on the 33 billion point, I think that's 33 billion for energy efficiency improvements and low carbon heat systems. I think it's the two. So it's kind of getting everything. And it's it's not just improving the fabric, but it's also implementing um, uh, heating systems at the same time. I think. Yeah, Thanks very much, Niall. Um, and uh, even if it's both, it's it's still a quite a big number. And uh, I'm I'm now going to ask Stuart where where that money is going to come from, which is a very unfair question. <laughs> but Stuart, if if um, I mean the UK Climate Change uh, Committee has estimated that on a UK wide basis, you know, from 2030. Um, the fifty billion pounds uh, extra is going to be required in terms of capital investment in the transition uh, to net zero across all sectors. And as Niall said, you know, thirty-three billion in, in Scotland alone for to achieve a number of those objectives. Those are, you know, we're used to hearing big numbers, but 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 in any context, those are massive numbers. And and if we do expect the majority, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but if we expect the majority of this to come from private uh, investment, do you have a sense of you know where that might come from in terms of you know pension schemes? Uh, it could be local authority pension schemes. It could be obviously insurance companies. Is there you know maybe this is a wider question? Is there do you think there's a dialogue out there happening already? Is there sufficient dialogue happening about public private uh, cooperation partnership to make sure that Private capital is incentivized in the right way because it strikes me that there's just not enough public budget around, um, especially with the COVID-inspired economic crisis. There's there's insufficient public uh, budget available to do all this. So I, I appreciate that's quite a, a challenging and wide-ranging question. But any, any thoughts would be appreciated. Yeah, a, a large checkbook for thirty-three billion pounds would be a good start. Yes. Um, I, I think I, I think if I can answer, we don't come directly to the question. I, I think we've got to try and do two things. I think first, the, the governments need to front up and say this is going to be expensive. You know, I, I heard the business secretary been interviewed in the Today programme yesterday morning. He was explicitly asked the question of this is going to be very expensive. And he sort of skirted round it and said, well, actually the economy is going to grow, so we'll be able to pay out of increased size of the economy. Now, I, I think that's overly simplistic and disingenuous. I think we need to politicians of all stripes need to front up and say this this is going to be expensive. Yet longer term we will see the benefits of this and we will see, you know, hopefully with better heating systems and cheaper heat pumps in time, cheaper electricity in time, we will see costs coming down. But it's in the short term this is going to cost a lot of money. I think we just need to we need to front up on that. I think to answer your your question on financing again. I think this is where there's been a real sea change in the last couple of years, and you've seen announcements from very big funds like BlackRock explicitly talking about putting money into a whole plethora of decarbonisation projects. So I I think the money's there. Clearly, people are going to only going to invest if they think they're going to get a return on capital. So probably a lot of upfront has got to be alongside the sort of Financial incentives that have been discussed already through subsidies from from governments, but I think there's real there, there's a huge amount, a huge you know, trade or a huge wall of investment money waiting there to to get invested in a whole range of opportunities. You know whether that is you know, improved heat pumps, it's improved electrolyzers, it's small modular nuclear reactors, it's everything. You know, and, and I think speaking very personally, you. The company I work for, H2 Green, we are backed by a company called GTEC. We raised money on the market early on this year. Now, we've historically been an oil and gas company. We're small, about £10 million market capitalisation. We raised £6.5 million to move into the energy transition from our from our shareholders, who are a mixture of private retail investors and, and bigger institutions in the UK. Now, we're a very small scale, that's £6 million, quid, not 
33 billion pounds but there's a real appetite from a whole range of investors to invest in this sort of opportunity in the energy transition thanks very much so I'm optimistic that, yeah i know literally i was about to say that that, that that's actually um yeah that, that that that's good that that that, that uh, shows that actually that there is a the potential there and i think it's then yeah, and i think yeah and i think the other thing and just you know, again sort of beating the drum of this you know you you know people will maybe rightly be skeptical about oil and gas companies being involved in investing in the energy transition there's been a huge decline in in upstream oil and gas investment in the last two or three years and huge investments by Shell, Total, in particular BP, even people like Exxon Mobil now are investing in the energy transition. And these are companies that are used to investing very large sums of money. They've got a huge amount of experience of running big, complicated projects, and they're used to be company fee, they're customer facing as well. So there's that there's money coming from big organizations like that investing in all these range of opportunities as well. Oh, that, that's great. Uh, sure, I really appreciate that uh, feedback, and that, that that is an optimistic uh, answer, which is which is great to hear. I, I'm I'm just now going to turn to questions that the audience have submitted, and and uh, we've had quite a lot. So thank you very much. Gary in Glasgow has been asking about the role of uh, uh, solar thermal technology in the transition to net zero, and in fact, it's been raised by quite a few people. I wonder if, and there's also a question about incentives for community renewable energy co-ops. Uh, Niall, perhaps I could ask you the question about solar thermal technology. How significant do you think that might be in terms of the, the mix? And uh, Catherine, maybe the, the, the question on community renewable energy co-ops I can, I can bring to you. So uh, Niall, solar, solar, solar technology, how, how, how big a role is that going to play? Uh, so, so on solar thermal rather than um, on solar PV, I mean, there's plenty of solar PV out there at the moment, and then you know there could be more. Um, on solar thermal, the, the, there's a, there's a role in there's a variety of different house types, and you know this, we have, you know if you look across the UK, it's different uh, you know types of climate as as, as well. Um, so there's a role for a variety of different technologies. Definitely, I mean, it's not all about heat pumps, really. Um, with solar thermal, I guess there's there's some uh, reservations as that will only provide your uh, hot water. Uh, it, it won't provide your, your your space heating as well. So you could have a solar thermal system, but you would need to have an additional system alongside that. And it might be the case that in your particular circumstances that it makes sense to have a solar thermal. Uh, it may be cost effective to do that to provide your hot water that way. Um, but as I say, you'll need an additional system to provide the, the space heating uh, in our kind of climate. It may be different if you're in, in uh, uh, different latitudes. Um, but yeah, as I say, there's there's a wide variety of technologies and a wide variety of contexts and circumstances. So there is a role for all these different te technologies. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there are some limitations to solar thermal, particularly in somewhere like Scotland. Oh, I appreciate that. Thanks, Niall. And Catherine, perhaps I can. There's a, the, the, my chat bar is quite busy with questions, which is great. Thank you to the audience for these questions. There's a couple of questions. One is the incentives for community renewable energy co-ops, and the second question, which will bring uh, other panel members into, is what heating options um, are going to be most affordable, affordable for for people on lower incomes. We, we've heard about a range of different energy sources, but I guess the, the the question for a lot of people is what's going to be most affordable. Um, so perhaps I can start with you, Catherine, and then in bring in Claudia in terms of the the, the affordability of, of different options. Yeah. So on the community side, I think we've seen some really lots of really nice examples of where community initiatives have worked for owning electricity infrastructure so community investment in small scale wind turbines community investment in solar farms those kind of things i think one of the barriers for heat is it's harder to see how it works because often you've got as i said before infrastructure in people's homes so there isn't sort of a community asset to see necessarily and then a lot of the sort of 
larger shared infrastructure like heat networks are just they're such big infrastructure projects such big uh, upfront investment costs that it would be hard to see how a community would even start with that so i think it's sort of appreciating that it is harder for community groups to get into um heating schemes but that's not to say that there isn't examples so there is a community owned heat network in biker uh, biker community trust own that own and operate that heat network so there are examples of where this has been a success i think for community groups i mean i i don't there was a community energy strategy a good number of years ago now i'm not sure if there's been any uh, additional incentives provided i think a lot of a lot of the issue is lear learning if every community group has to learn how to do it themselves then that's a huge amount of people's resource and social capital and time whereas if you can get some shared learning between community groups that's probably going to be really helpful it makes me wonder if the pandemic is going to affect sort of involvement in community energy groups just because everybody's you know at their limit of what they're coping with um in a lot of instances and community groups need people with the drive and energy to get out there and do something i mean i'm hopeful that community initiatives still come through um i think the, the other thing is under, for heat as well it's understanding shared um models of ownership where say you might have some shared thermal storage and maybe a, sh a small scale shared ground source heat network there are options where you can see a community scheme getting together and i think it's also this links to a little bit the financing question where we need to see new business models coming through so things like heat as a service uh, is is an interesting avenue to explore i think where um you're sort of looking for the other benefits it's not a you know a, not necessarily all about the financial return on investment it's about securing the other benefits that you get from uh, community owned infrastructure i mean i think there's a lot of potential i think it's just a little bit harder than on the electricity side but it would be great to see more more things come through thanks so much very much Catherine. um and ronnie claudia i'll bring you into this question ronnie in dumfries is asking the question which i think is is you know cuts through uh, you know to to the one of the most important questions you know what what heating options do you expect to be most affordable for people on lower incomes which uh, i think is a question a lot of people will, will be asking do you have a do you have a view on that or, or is it kind of too early to tell does it does it depend in part on on government incentives and government subsidy Yes, it a lot uh, depends on uh, the government support on uh, this. At the moment, uh, most of it is based uh, on gas, uh, so uh, uh, and is is cheaper than electricity. But thinking about uh, our targets and decarbonisation, uh, we have especially for 2035 and and 2050, we should think about. Uh, if for, for low income, if we get the renewables um, in with the reduction of uh, of uh, cost um, and then the right uh, carbon taxes in, for example, uh, gas and the other uh, sources, um, if we manage to get this 100% uh, renewables uh, generation, electricity could be uh, a good uh, future option. Uh, together with uh, with the heat pumps and uh, uh, especially if they are used in a community um, uh, way so because we have a lot of this uh, low income um, uh, ha housing actually in that uh, in that way now the the support from the government was, is key in this is uh, the support in terms of subsidies and also the support in terms of investment in uh, energy in energy retrofit thank you very much claudia now we'll, we'll, we'll i'm going to ask each of the panel members to provide a one minute summary of what i guess their key asks would be in terms of policy priorities or whatever else you think might be most important to highlight before before i do that and perhaps niall i'll start with you on that but let me ask a very quick question of stuart because wayne from sterling 
has asked about you know what additional information can be given to householders or house builders about what different options uh, they can use to uh, increase energy efficiency in their house or have a re renewable energy source. And the, the, the reason I'm asking, for example, digital uh, information, the reason I'm asking you, Stuart, is you've been through that uh, personally by the sounds of it in your, you know, your, your own home as well as professionally dealing with this. Any quick ideas in terms of how we can, can get best information out there to the public? Well, there's, a huge, there's actually a huge amount of information online. So there's whole loads of green energy groups, and there's people. I had probably within a week half a dozen different people coming round and selling these systems in the house. So actually, you know, yeah, the information is out there. There's a lot of people. How you try and decide who are the good ones rather than the, let's say, slightly less scrupulous people is probably a, is a difficult judgment, as it is with lots of different trades you might want to get in your house. But actually, I was remarkably pleased as to how easy it is actually to get the information to get people to come out, look at your house, measure up your house, tell you what you need to do, and actually run the models for you in Excel spreadsheet. If you're a sad geek like me, in the spreadsheets and actually show you how much this is going to cost. So getting the information actually isn't a difficult bit. It's the next stage of saying, right, is this actually right right for me now with the costs involved? Brilliant. Okay, well, that, that, that's good to know, Stuart. And uh, thank you, everyone uh, in the audience who submitted questions. I'm very, very sorry if we didn't get to your individual question. It's just uh, we've covered a huge amount of ground. And uh, it's now time just to sum up um, a minute at the most. If I could ask our panel members just to, as I said, highlight what for them is going to be some of the most important issues to address in the, the, the months and years ahead. Uh, Niall, then Catherine, please. Uh, um, the most important issue, probably public awareness um, and acceptance and engagement with the with the changes that are necessary in heat. So I think it's all uh, everyone would accept it's very difficult. Uh, that it, uh, potentially could be quite expensive, but I also think that, as I pointed out earlier, the vast majority of people accept the reason for change. And so um, once we kind of recognise that. Uh, then we uh, need to well, think of uh, the most well, effective way of doing something that, that will be very difficult and potentially uh, quite expensive. Brilliant. Catherine? Um, for me, I think it's about highlighting the multiple benefits of doing these things. I think the, the climate crisis is urgent and we know what the targets are around that. That doesn't necessarily mobilise people on a day-to-day -day basis. But what does is thinking about energy savings, uh, health benefits, reduction in fuel poverty, reduction in air pollution. We've not mentioned air pollution, but that does come into it when we're thinking about things like um, wood stoves, which are terribly bad for air pollution. Uh, but the IEA did a really excellent piece of work on what are the multiple benefits of energy efficiency alone and put that into actual numbers of cost savings, and they're phenomenal when you start to look across sectors so when you start to say if we invest in energy how much might we save on the health budget those numbers start to add up and be huge and i think that really focuses people's mind not just on the urgency of the climate crisis but why we should be doing these things anyway energy efficiency we need to be doing it anyway it's it's a no regret option some of the other things uh, around changing heating systems can be more difficult but again i think it's about if you're thinking about local actors, what are the reasons for doing it? Regeneration, fuel poverty, community groups, all those things would be really powerful messages. I think it's drawing it all together. Thanks very much, Catherine. Claudia, and finally, Stuart, please. Uh, okay, I think uh, there is a, a, a mix here. Uh, awareness is uh, uh, one of the things. Continue the support of uh, uh, renewables, so uh, we meet the, the, the carbonization, uh, plus uh, uh, the efficiency, support and efficiency uh, of uh, energy use. Um, this uh, together with uh, good information so really we get people and engage people with a policy and the right policy uh, instruments uh, well uh, accepted by uh, 
people so they can really be implemented and uh, and make a real uh, impact and uh, effect in the process. Thank you, Claudia. And finally, Stuart. Well, I'm really positive. I think you could be looking in 15 years' time of a very different situation where we all are living in you know, much better insulated houses. We're relying largely on electricity to run heat pumps, and we've got electric cars on the drive. I, I'm actually really positive that you can get to that point, and we can actually end up in a situation where we're all heating our houses cheaper than we are today. The challenge is how you get from here to there and do it in a way that doesn't cost too much money. And as, if, as everybody said, I think really value support the most disadvantaged people in society to make those really difficult changes as well. But I'm really optimistic that come 15 years' time, we'd have, we could be in a very different position, a much, much better position in terms of decarbonising our heating in our homes. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Sure, that's a fantastic uh, way to end, and uh, end we must because we are up against the clock. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening. I'd like to thank the audience members for your questions. Uh, again, I'm sorry if we didn't quite get to them. I'd like to thank our panel members for a, a wide-ranging, very insightful uh, dialogue and contribution to these events. Uh, this event this evening was brought to you in partnership with the School of Social and Political Science, University of Edinburgh. I hope you've enjoyed it. There's been, uh, as I said, a huge number of topics raised, uh, topics of, of massive significance. So let me thank once again our panel, Dr. Catherine Bale, Dr. Stuart Patton, Dr. Claudia Aravina, and Dr. Niall Kerr for giving up your valuable time this evening. Very much appreciated. And finally, let me just take a very brief opportunity to remind everyone that over the next three days, there will be a number of other discussions in terms of uh, the transition to net zero. We have a session on fast fashion to the just transition, uh, a fashion on diversity in politics and climate activism. And we have uh, an in-conversation session with the world-renowned scientist, Dr. Suzanne Simard, whose uh, life and book about uh, the world of trees is about to be made into a Hollywood film. So uh, please stay tuned and please join the other sessions when you can. And on that note, uh, thank you again, everyone. Have uh, Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.